Sometimes while you're meditating, listening to a Dharma talk, you want to hear about what you're experiencing right now, what you can do with it. Other times it's good to hear about what things could happen right now. They may not be happening yet, but when they do happen, they'll be right here. One of the major milestones in the practice is what's called the gaining of the Dhamma eye. It's also called stream entry. It's the first of the noble attainments. It's expressed in Pali. In Ginchi Samodhya Tamang Sabanta Nirota Tamanti, whatever is subject to origination is all subject to passing away. Now some people see that simply as a statement that everything that arises passes away. You accept the fact of inconstancy or impermanence. But what kind of experience would lead you to accept that principle? And why would it be a milestone? The Buddha's language is very particular, and you have to think about what experience would lead you to say something like that that would be both legitimate and natural, in other words, it really would be well-founded and it would occur spontaneously to the mind. You look in the canon, there are some cases where People who already were wandering ascetics, listening to the Buddha's teachings. And it's almost always in conjunction with the Four Noble Truths would gain this particular insight. Other times you see people have no religious background at all. They listen to the Buddha's teachings. Sometimes you give them the graduated discourse, build up to the Four Noble Truths. And this is the insight they would come away with. Even the case of the people who were sent to kill the Buddha, and then to kill the person who killed the Buddha, and then to kill the person who killed the person who killed the Buddha. The first person came to see the Buddha. He was frozen stiff with fear. And the Buddha said, have no fear. The man came. And the Buddha taught him the Dharma, and he became a stream matter right there. He gained the Dharma eye. And the other people, you can imagine, they were, these are pretty rough characters. They saw the first person wasn't coming, so they came, found the Buddha. He taught them the Dharma. They gained the Dharma eye. So what kind of experience would lead even people like that to come to the conclusion that whatever is subject to origination is also subject, all subject to passing away? And why would it be such a big milestone? Part of the answer lies in one of the conversations around this. When Sariputta, at the time, was just a wanderer of another sect, heard the Dharma from Asaji, he gained the Dharma eye. He goes back and he's going to tell Moggallana, his friend. Moggallana sees him from the distance, coming. He says, your, your face is bright, your eyes are bright. Has something happened? Have you seen the deathless? And Sariputta says yes. So that's the first clue. You're not just watching things arising and passing away, but you're seeing something that doesn't arise and doesn't pass away. In fact, it's that experience that there is a deathless element that can be touched at the mind. You have that experience, you look back at everything else you've experienced up to that point. You realize that that is not subject to a rising or passing away. It's always been there, and it's not going to change. It's outside of time. Everything else that's inside time is subject to origination and passing away. The other clue comes from that word origination and cessation. These are not the words simply of impermanence. These are the words that were related to the Four Noble Truths, dependent core rising. And the word origination is almost always used in conjunction with things that arise in the mind. What's the origination of suffering? Craving. Where is craving? It's in the mind. 
What's the origination of the causal chain that leads to craving? It's ignorance. Again, something that comes out of the mind. You begin to realize all the other things that come out of the mind. Fabrication, name and form, consciousness, the six sense media, the fact that you're aware of the six senses. There's something in the mind that flows out to the senses, which allows you to have that experience of the senses to begin with. When you can see the mind at a point where it's not doing that, the senses go away, all six of them. What the Buddha calls the all at one point, and something that's beyond the all. Although they say you have to be very careful about how you talk about it, still it's something that's it's not to be described, but it's to be experienced. So when you've had that experience, you come back from that. It's that's the experience that cuts through the first three fetters. It's not like you decide that you're going to give up on identity views, or you're going to give up on uncertainty, or you're going to give up on grasping at habits and practices. These aren't things you decide. It's that experience of the deathless that cuts through those fetters. Your uncertainty is gone because you realize that what the Buddha said was true. The Buddha knew what he was talking about. There really is a deathless element. And you realize how you got there. It wasn't just through obeying rules. You had to use your discernment. You had to use your concentration. You have to be really observant of what's, what's going on in the mind when it's concentrated. And the fact that there is an awareness that has nothing to do with the aggregates. That's why you would never give your allegiance to any idea that yourself is any way related to the aggregates. Because there are no aggregates in that experience. And yet there's an awareness. You don't take that awareness as yourself. Although the problem is, if you just stay at stream entry or the other first three stages of awakening, there still is going to be a lingering sense of self. Simply that it's not identified around the aggregates, either as identical with the aggregates or possessing the aggregates or in the aggregates or containing the aggregates within it. So it's not like you can decide you're going to cut the fetters. The fetters get cut for you. Another misunderstanding about the Dharma is that some people say it's when you see there is no self. But again, you have to ask, what kind of experience would give you a valid grounds for saying there is no self? Some people say, well, you just totally blank out, but that doesn't prove anything. There are states of concentration that the Buddha calls non-perception. They're not noble states. If you happen to die while you're in them, you go into the state of non-percipient beings. You're totally unconscious. And when that attainment wears off, you regain consciousness and you leave that state and you come back. But that's no proof of anything. In fact, if seeing that there is no self were part of stream entry, why was it that the Buddha had to give the not-self discourse to the five brethren after they'd all become stream enters? There is one passage in the, the canon where there's an, a non-returner who says, okay, you don't identify around the five aggregates, even though there still is this lingering sense of self, lingering sense of I am. He says it's like the smell of the detergent you might use to wash clothes. You wash the clothes, you wash the detergent out, but there's still some lingering scent. So when the Buddha was teaching the Five Brethren the, the Not-Self Discourse, that was what he was getting at, it was that lingering sense of self, the conceit I am. So stream entry is not simply accepting the fact of impermanence. 
and it's not seeing that there is no self. It's having an experience of the deathless, and you realize that it was nothing that you did. In fact, it was that moment in the present moment when you were not putting any intentional input in at all, even not even the intention not to do anything. It hit you by surprise. Then when you come back from that experience, that's when the Dharma arises. You realize, okay, you were there. Something that was not originated, not subject to cessation. And from that vantage point, you realize everything else you'd experienced up to that point was fabricated through the actions of the mind. And here you found something that was not fabricated. That's why it's so radical, because you realize also that it is the end of suffering. Now, stream entry is said to be the Dharma Eye because you see this, but you don't fully experience it. Otherwise, you have your glimpse and then it's gone. But it's already made that big change in you. There's an analogy that's given to the count. It's like someone who sees water at the bottom of a well but doesn't drink the water, but knows it's there. Of course, the most useful part of stream entry, or useful thing to discuss about stream entry, is not what it is, but how to get there. One of the most useful discussions is simply the definition of the stream, which is the Eightfold Path, Noble Eightfold Path. That's something you can do. You can't do stream entry, but you can do the path. The path takes you there. So you focus your energy there, on the path. The other discussion, of course, is the four factors for stream entry. You find a person of integrity. You listen to the true Dhamma. You apply appropriate attention. You practice the Dhamma in accordance with the Dhamma. That's how you get there. It's all very plain stuff. Now, as the Buddha said, there, there were no secrets that he kept up to the last moment. In other words, it's not the case that the Buddha says, well, do this practice, and then when you get near stream entry, I'll tell you something special new. It's, it's not like that at all. You just do what you've been doing, but you do it really well and do it really carefully. Try to get the mind centered. Try to protect that sense of the centered mind. You detect any stress in that state of concentration, you ask yourself, what am I doing to cause that? When you see the action, and it's usually a perception, although sometimes it can also be directed thought and evaluation, any of the factors of right concentration that you have to let go of to get to higher levels. And you just keep working at that. How do you get the mind to settle in? Once it's settled in, you've as the Buddha says, you've indulged in the concentration. In other words, you don't just skip, skip, skip across the states of concentration. You have to learn how to inhabit them so you get to know them well. So that when you see something that's disturbing it, it's, it's your own discernment that's seeing that. It's not because you said there was some book that told me I have to drop this factor or that factor. You see that you're doing something. You see that you're doing something that's causing disturbance. You can drop it, and the mind can stay concentrated. In fact, it gets more solidly concentrated when you drop it. If it so happens you drop it and you lose your concentration, it's a sign you're not ready yet. But it's the same process again and again and again, just that it gets more precise. Your mindfulness gets more continuous. Your discernment gets sharper. And there comes a point when you realize if you stay where you are, there's still going to be some stress. If you move to any other state of concentration, there will also be stress. What's the alternative between staying and moving? And 
that provides the possibility for there to be a time when there is no intention, there is no intentional input at all, and things can open up. And the Dhamma I gets to see. So regardless of your background, whether you've studied a lot or studied little, that doesn't matter. And it's not a question of simply adopting the Buddha's views and getting to the point where you agree, yes, I agree with the Buddha now. It's more that he gives you a task to do, and you do the task, and you're going to learn some important things about what is actually possible in the mind. And the possibility is there for everybody, which is why the Dhammai is always the same for everybody. The five brethren who had practiced for many, many years. For the ruffians, who one of them was going to kill the Buddha and the other was who were going to kill the other ruffians. They saw the same thing. So the important part is doing the practice, and just doing it very meticulously and very well, and using your, your discernment, using your ingenuity to ask the right questions. And the questions are the key that will unlock things and open them up.